Welcome to BFR Radio, a podcast dedicated to all things BFR. This podcast is proudly sponsored by sportsrehab.com.au, where if you want to buy your own BFR cuffs or you want more information about the type of training or you just want more information, this is your one place to go. And I'm your host, Chris Gavilio. Welcome back to this episode of BFR Radio. Hope you're doing well. And also, I hope you've been enjoying these articles of incorporating BFR into more of a specific sports training focus. For me, this is refreshing to talk about as literature typically just focuses on BFR and resistance training or just stationary cardio exercise. And on this, a lot of BFR cuffs, which includes my own brand here, that's a shameless plug, don't have a permanent tubing from the cuffs to the pump which allows for BFR training to be totally free. And therefore, the application of BFR in your own environment is really only limited by you as the coach or alternatively as the athlete. And I do think that when introduced systematically in small bouts, I feel that you can all start to experience the positive inclusion of blood flow restriction. However, saying that, I advocate that this is one tool in the toolbox. It's a very good tool at that, but in an elite athletic environment, there's still a need to include more traditional training methods. And this may be, you just need to lift heavy loads, you actually have to do the sport without the cuffs on because of the high intensity nature of the type of training. But if you look at your training and how you can try and enhance the response, whether that's with strength training, recovery, something a little bit more low intensity, BFR could potentially offer your athlete something that a little bit different that they may not have had before. On to the article. This is the fourth and the last article in the short mini series. And as I start to prep for the next series, can you let me know what topics within the world of BFR training you're interested in? Because I really want to tailor these podcast episodes to you. And I'm really keen to actually also get a few interviews of people that are using BFR. Also, if you are looking for content, I do have a lot of practical videos on my YouTube channel, which is Sports Rehab Oz. That's Sports Rehab AUS. And also on my Instagram page, which is at Chris Cavillio. If we refer back to the start of this mini series, I was inspired by the Tokyo 2021 Olympic and Paralympic Games and really thought at the time that it was relevant. The first article, it focused on futsal training, and I felt that it fitted well within the sport of football for my Northern Hemisphere friends, or soccer for my Southern Hemisphere friends. Article 2 focused on running, and then Article 3 looked at how passive BFR used prior to high-intensity swimming efforts can positively influence performance. Now, today's article, we're back on the land and hopping on our bikes. The article I'm reviewing is called The Effects of Low-Intensity Cycle Training with Restricted Leg Blood Flow on Thigh Muscle Volume and VO2 Max in Young Men. The primary author is Takashi Abe, who is quite prolific in the world of BFR literature, and it comes out of the University of Tokyo in Japan. I picked this article out due to the authors looking into the concurrent improvements in both aerobic capacity and muscle hypertrophy in response to a single mode of training. A lot of the papers on BFR cycling I looked at in preparation for this episode tended to only focus on one capacity or measurement. If we look briefly into the background to the study, the authors initially reference and focus on the concept of interference in strength development when aerobic training is added to resistance training. Despite this, skeletal muscle shows an enormous plasticity to adapt to stimuli such as metabolic and or contractile activities. Based on the principle of specificity of exercise, resistance exercise elicits specific muscular adaptations with little improvement in the physiological adaptations experienced with typical aerobic training. Conversely, aerobic training is thought to stimulate improvements in cardiovascular fitness such as VO2 max and anaerobic threshold. Within muscle, opposite morphological and physiological adaptive responses to these two types of training occur in myofibril protein content, mitochondrial volume density, capillary density, enzymes reflecting aerobic energy production, and also anabolic signaling pathways. You can see there's a lot going on there with these two types of training. Therefore, as we could see here, it would be a really great advantage if we could develop a training method that could effectively and concurrently improve both cardiovascular and muscular fitness within a singular mode of training. 
If we look specifically at BFR, one of the many advantages of using blood flow restriction during low intensity resistance training is the similar muscle hypertrophy as traditional high intensity resistance training. Improvements in muscle strength and leg muscle hypertrophy have also been seen with BFR walking. In addition, significantly greater oxygen uptake and heart rate are observed during slow treadmill walking with BFR than when compared without BFR. Therefore, the advantage of BFR training along with improvements in strength capacities at low loads and intensities is greater oxygen uptake and heart rate. The authors hypothesized that the potential benefits of BFR exercise could include not only anabolic response by the muscular system, but also improvements in cardiovascular fitness. The purpose of the current study was to investigate the effect of low intensity exercise training with BFR on muscle size and strength, as well as VO2 max in young male subjects. If we look at the methods, 19 young men aged between 20 to 26 years were randomized into two groups. One was a BFR training group where there was nine subjects and there was also a control or a non-BFR group where there was 10. Training was performed once a day, three days a week for eight weeks. Once again here, a really simple training protocol. Following measurements of body weight and mid-thigh girth, the subject cycled on a stationary bike at a predetermined 40% of VO2 max for 15 minutes in the BFR training group and 40% of VO2 max for 45 minutes in the controlled non-BFR training group. The exercise intensity and duration of each group remained constant throughout the whole training period. Those in the BFR training group wore Katsu brand pressure cuffs, which has a thinner cuff width. Now this next bit is really interesting. And I would say that most people who have read this article may have skipped over this or not truly understood why this was done. What they did is prior to the BFR training, subjects were seated on a chair and the belt air pressure was set at 120 millimeters of mercury for 30 seconds. And this pressure was a lot lower than the actual training pressure that they were going to use. And after this 30 seconds, the air pressure was released. The cuff was then reinflated and the air pressure was increased by another 20 millimeters of mercury. And this was held for 30 seconds again and then released for 10 seconds. This was performed continuously until the final occlusion pressure for each training day was reached. On the first day of training, the final belt pressure, or the training pressure, was 160 millimeters of mercury. Now, this protocol of repeated inflation and deflation is, if we refer to the last paper, is similar to ischemic preconditioning. But in the world of katsu, it's actually called katsu joatsu. So it's J-O-A-T-S-U. This is actually a preparatory cycle for the vasculature with respect to the upcoming training pressure load. Now in the world of BFR, this is not actually done due to what I see as the academic driven nature of blood flow restriction prescription. Now I actually rate this type of preparatory cycle prior to BFR training. And I think of it as a warm-up prior to your first set of BFR training. And I've found that personally, but also with the clients that I prescribe BFR with, that their first set feels a lot more comfortable. And globally, for new users to BFR, or those who have larger limb circumferences and therefore higher training pressures, it actually really helps to get used to those cuff pressures on the limb for that first set. Anyway, back to the article. As the subjects adapted to the occlusive stimulus, the training pressure was increased by 10 millimeters each week until a final belt pressure of 210 millimeters of mercury was reached. Now, this pressure may seem a little high, but remember that the Katsu brand cuffs were used, and this has a thinner band, and therefore the band width is a determining factor with what percentage of limb occlusion or final pressure someone would use. Blood flow to the leg muscles was restricted for a total of approximately 18 minutes. That was three minutes preparation time and 15 minutes of cycling time during each training session with the belt pressure released immediately upon completion of the session. During all training sessions, heart rate was recorded at the fifth and the 15th minute for the BFR training group and the control non-BFR group. Ratings of perceived exertion which was a Borg 15-point scale, was also recorded at the end of the training session. 
if we look at the way that they investigated the changes in the muscle size or the circumference, two measurements were taken to highlight these changes in thigh muscles. Firstly, mid-thigh girth was measured with a tape measure, and the muscle cross-sectional area was determined from an MRI of the mid-thigh. This was then highlighted as both the collective cross-sectional area of the quadriceps muscle group, as well as the thigh muscle groups, i.e. the quadriceps and hamstrings. These measurements were taken at baseline and at three days after the final training session. If we look at a strength measurement, maximal voluntary isometric strength of the knee extensors and flexors were determined using a Bidex system. For those who are not familiar with what a Bidex system is, think of it as a massive seated leg extension and leg curl machine linked to a computer. At a set angle, the subjects will do either a leg extension or knee extension and then a seated leg hamstring curl or knee flexion isometrically. With respect to this study, maximal isometric force or rather maximal voluntary contraction was measured. If we look at how they measured changes in fitness, subjects completed a VO2 max test on a stationary bike. And during this, heart rate and exercise time to exhaustion was also taken. Just in summary, we had two groups. One was a BFR group which trained for 15 minutes at 40% of VO2 max. And the second group was the control non-BFR group, where they trained for 45 minutes at 40% of their VO2 max. It was an eight-week study where they trained once a day for three times a week. Looking at the results prior to the start of the eight-week training program, or at baseline, there were no differences between the two groups for standing height, body weight, body mass index, and mid-thigh girth. Following the training program, there were no significant changes in body weight and BMI for either group. However, mid-thigh girth increased in the BFR training group only. Looking a little bit deeper into the changes in the mid-thigh girth, muscle cross-sectional area increased significantly by 3.4% for the thigh and 4.6% for the quadriceps in the BFR training group. If we look at the changes in the muscle strength or muscle force, Maximal isometric knee extension strength tended to increase in the BFR training group. That was a 7.7% increase, but there were no changes in the control non-BFR group. Just to note here that there were no changes in the isometric knee flexion strength for either group. Heart rate ranged between 129 to 149 beats per minute for the BFR training subjects and between 105 and 141 for the control training subjects. The changes in absolute and relative VO2 max increased in the BFR training group, and this was significant, but did not change in the controlled non-BFR group. There was also an increase in exercise time until exhaustion in the BFR training group, and this was 15.4%, but there was no changes in the control non-BFR group. Overall, this study demonstrated that low intensity, that's 40% of VO2 max, short duration cycling with BFR can elicit improvements in muscle volume in healthy young subjects. The aerobic capacity also improved concurrently following this type of training. Previously, concurrent improvements in muscular strength and aerobic capacity by a single mode of exercise have been achieved after much higher and long duration exercise training. However, none of these studies demonstrated significant muscle hypertrophy if we look towards other BFR studies, following four weeks of cycle training under local leg ischemia, VO2 max improved despite a reduction in maximal knee extension strength. Here, no change in thigh muscle cross-sectional area was observed. Previous non-BFR studies have reported that combining aerobic training with resistance exercise negatively affected resistance training-induced muscular hypertrophy. In the present study, there were increases in thigh and quadriceps muscle cross-sectional area that was 4.1 and 5.1% respectively. And there was also an improvement in muscle volume of 3.2 to 5.3%. And these were similar to increments observed in previous high-intensity resistance training only studies. With respect to the isometric strength measures, although there was a 7.7% change in knee extension strength, it was not significant. The authors highlighted that this was due to the large individual variations in the strength adaptation with BFR cycling. In the previous podcast, where we looked at the use of BFR passively prior to swimming, it showed the individual results. 
most people responded well, but there were a few people that were non-responders. And I enjoyed reading papers that highlight the individual results, and this further demonstrates the individuality of this type of intervention. Well, really most interventions, to be honest. Again, BFR training produced a 6.4% increase in absolute VO2 max and a 15.4% increase in exercise time until exhaustion. And furthermore, the magnitude of change in VO2 max, that's the percentage increase in VO2 max divided by the total training sessions in the BFR training group was 0.25%. And this is similar to those reported in other non-BFR aerobic training studies. An interesting point in the discussion that I'd like to mention was around the idea that the minimum stimulus to evoke change is approximately 50% of VO2 max. And furthermore, if exercise intensity is low, longer duration efforts greater than 35 minutes are suggested. And conversely, if the exercise is of shorter duration, we must train at a higher intensity. Kind of makes sense. In the present study, exercise intensity and duration were set at 40% of VO2 max and 15 minutes only in the BFR training group. Therefore, the increase in VO2 max by the BFR training was proposed to be due to adaptations in muscle oxidative capacity and stroke volume, where stroke volume is the amount of blood your heart pumps each time it beats. In addition, the authors suggested that the increase in lower body muscle mass may be also associated with improvements in VO2 max in the BFR training group. Overall, this is a great study highlighting the positive effect in lower intensity and short duration cycling. Apart from improvements in aerobic capacity and time to exhaustion, thigh strength and size were also reported. So where does this fit in? These are my thoughts, but I think this could be a great addition in the following scenarios. Firstly, if you're injured or coming back from an injury, many times I've seen people told to ride a bike at a comfortable intensity. And most of the time, it's just too easy to elicit any kind of physiological benefit. Now, when injured, this may not be the primary reason of doing some sort of stationary exercise, but it's typically a starting point. In this scenario, why isn't BFR being added? There isn't any increase in mechanical stress on the structures. The second one would be starting off an exercise program. Most people want to see and feel progress. And when starting a new fitness program, it's usually advised to progressively increase training volume and intensity. Now, this takes time if done safely for the longevity of the person training. And again, the addition of BFR can help the client to see the improvements while safely increasing training volume. The third way it could be used is for athletes who train a lot. And some of these athletes do a lot of low intensity training, and sometimes these are called junk miles. And as they're already doing a lot of training, the addition of BFR can help keep the total training duration down with a physiological benefit. Further to this, in elite athletes and sport dependent, such as running based sports, a lot of these athletes suffer from bone stress reactions and due to their high training volume, are not able to devote a lot of time to strength training of substantial benefit. Another positive benefit of using BFR during strength training, it's been shown to improve markers of bone reformation. This is highlighted through different pathway activations and could provide a way to assist with safeguarding the athletes better for potential bone injuries. And I've definitely used this for a few athletes who have suffered from bone stress reactions and fractures. It has enabled them to resume their level of training a lot sooner without losing as much of their physiological profile that is essential for performance. I hope you enjoyed that paper. If you have used BFR in cycling for your own use and seen positive results, drop me a line and let me know. It'd be really great to hear your story. And a couple of favors from me to you. If you know of someone who would benefit from this episode, please share it. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes. If you're interested in purchasing your own set of BFR cuffs, please visit my website, which is sportsrehab.com.au. I can also help you with your training, so contact me via my website or DM me through my socials, which is at Chris Cavillio. Thanks for listening. See you next time, and remember to keep the pump.